I say that everyone's muted, so I'm gonna. I'm just gonna take the fact that no one. <laughs> you start, Jonathan. Most we people can start. look like they're back. Yes. Excellent. Right. That is good. Um, so I'm not Liz Bowl. Uh, Liz is fighting a by-election today, so she couldn't be here. So I'm 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 Jonathan Walcroft. I'm uh, a parish councillor in Kingham, which is in North East Somerset. But I'm going to be speaking in my capacity. I was the head of field for Dan Norris's successful mayoral campaign, uh, which we heard a lot about this morning. And we'll be joined by people from across the country who also experienced some success in May. Kind of, you could see the positive side of it. Um, we've got, I, th I think everybody's here. Uh, do you want me to introduce people before the slide goes down? Or? Okay. So uh, we've got Jeremy Rowe, who's joining us from South Norfolk. We've got Shada Hussain, who's joining us from Cherwell, which as I know is in Oxfordshire. We've got Rebecca Cooper, who's joining us from Worthing. And Neil Griffith, who is joining us from Wales, as our Shadow Welsh Secretary. We're talking about what we're doing in government in Wales. So... I am happy to get started. In that case, unless uh, is, is, is the is the slide still going to be that perfect? Good, excellent. So yeah, I, I was the head of field for Dan Norris's Metro Mayoral campaign. We heard a lot about it this morning, um, but I thought I'd go into a bit more sort of detail into what happened. Um, so as a child, North East Somerset was a Labour seat when I was growing up. Uh, obviously, Dan was the MP. It's a seat that it's got a lot of mining heritage in it. Places like Polton. Obviously, Grant, who spoke earlier, is, is the councillor for Bradstock, Clutton. So, yeah, it's an old-fashioned old mining constituency in lots of places. Uh, but what was amazing about this election was it wasn't just the Labour vote was coming back in our traditional Labour areas that had gone away from us over the last 15, 10 years. It was that Labour's vote was going up in areas we've never had support, like little tiny villages that we've probably never canvassed in before. We turned up in the election sort of to see what would happen and people who, who had been voting Tory or Liberal Democrat their entire lives uh, were voting Labour for the first time. And the effect that had, was we actually won part of North East Somerset, the local authority, for the first time ever in uh, May. We've, we've come second to Lib Dem, we've come second to the Tories before, we've never actually won it before. So it shows that, you know, Dan, Dan or as I say, uh, if this had come out before Harleyville, it might have been a different story about local elections in May, I think. Yeah, we had some really unprecedented gains uh, in my part of the world. So we were pretty, pretty pleased with how it went. And I think, hopefully, as well, everyone else on the panel is going to have felt the same way about. So I think we'll go, we can go sort of east to west. Maybe that's the best way to, to do it. Uh, Jeremy, are you happy to come in? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so shall I start now? Yes, please, Jeremy. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll do what I can in five minutes. I'll talk pretty quick. Um, this isn't going to be to everyone's taste, by the way, because it, it's a bit disruptive, but we just really wanted to come out the elections differently because we just felt that the old processes historically were, were, were a bit loosey in terms of, uh, of actually get, getting, any, getting anywhere. So we changed very fundamentally how we went about the elections um, and it worked really well. 2019, I got elected to the South Norfolk District Council, first Labour win anywhere in South Norfolk since 1999. In fact, Daniel Zeitner was the best last person to win anywhere in South Nor Norfolk for Labour. So we were really pleased with that. And then 2021 stood for the county council elections. Very little chance of winning, but got the sixth highest Labour vote out of 84 areas. 1,372 votes, highest Labour vote here since 1974. Actually won in some of the big ballot boxes. And also the turnout was raised as well. And that's one of the things coming through this morning, I think, that we're almost re-educating people about local politics and about Labour local politics, and they're seeing it in a different light through our actions. The words are fine, but ultimately they're just words, but it's getting stuck in at a local parish, local council, county council level, and actually making a big difference to people's lives, which is really galvanising and gaining that support. And as we start to link that up, well, I, I'm convinced this, this is the route back to power for us. So how did we achieve those incredible gains? Well, the first thing we did is worked incredibly hard. The second thing we did is worked incredibly hard. And the third thing we did is worked incredibly hard. And there's just no way around that. You've got to go right through that. Um, we had a plan which we kept very simple. Our phrase was keep it very simple and execute brilliantly. And I was talking to Alex earlier, the execution's got to be faultless, really. But we did that. 
And we did everything. We left nothing to chance. We didn't leave a single parish. We went round again, went round again, went round again, made sure everything was perfect. And the, the speech I was thinking about is Churchill, we'll fight them on the beaches. He didn't say, we'll fight them on one or two of the beaches, maybe on a Tuesday. It was literally the whole thing. And that's what we had to do. We had to, uh, we had to hit every single aspect of every point of this campaign and get it right to give ourselves even a modicum of chance of making some sort of breakthrough. So what did we do differently? This is the crux of it, really. Wrote to individual members. There's 80 odd members in our area. There's all these thousands of Labour members and not all was active. So we wanted to reactivate those guys that joined the Labour Party for the right reason. So put a really nice letter to get together about Norfolk's radical tradition and what we can do in the future and what we can do on the ground. Hand delivered it to, went around to 84 homes, hand delivering it to try and get them involved in the campaign, introduce myself. We use social media, and that's been mentioned earlier. That's a hugely important thing for us. But it's got to triangulate with the message on the ground as well. Otherwise, it's just in the air somewhere. Um, stood outside the co-op, meeting people, handing out leaflets, answering questions. Leafleted 4,000 homes, door knocked 4,000 homes. I was out there every time. If I, if I door knocked and they weren't in, I put a postcard through the door with a handwritten bit on me, saying, reminding them that I'd actually been around to the house and hand-delivered it myself. People love door knocking. Door knocking is Labour's Exocet missile. It's the one thing we've got the toys will never have the people power to compete with and people love it as well. But, you, but it's not enough on its own. And the thing we did, we called the Wolverhampton method. We based it because when Wolverhampton made the locks for the whole world, when these people were making locks, if they dropped one, they weren't allowed to pick it up because they can make the next one quicker and they can bend down and pick up the other one. So it's a brilliant time and motion study. So our theory was, don't get involved in a half-hour debate on the doorstep trying to change someone's mind, because while you're doing that, that will be 90 homes you won't reach ever, which you would have done. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we were incredibly efficient on this, and, and it worked brilliantly, so the numbers were incredible. Everyone's got a winning number. There's an X number of door knocks will win you your seat. It might be massive, it might be tiny, but you don't know what the X number is, but there's an X number in every constituency. I also did, I'm going to... I'm not going to swear here, call it the bleep tax. But if I got a really nasty Tory answering the door, and you get that now and again, just horrendous, don't you? I vow to do another 50 doors just to do a sort of, a, there you go then, mate, sort of a petty revenge to them. So if you get a really bad reaction, just do 50 more houses than you would have done and, and, and remind yourself that's their fault. Um, now, <laughs> but why does this stuff matter? That's the thing. It matters locally when the pandemic hit. It was only me that led that and galvanised the community and put a help group together, which is still in existence. Where were the Tories on that? They couldn't care less. They're not mm -hmm. in it for mm -hmm. that. And, but they were mm -hmm. hopelessly exposed by that, I think. They just weren't interested in that local level human politics mm -hmm. bit. They're not in it. They're in it for, what are they in it for? I don't know, planning to to be with the great and the good. They just weren't interested. And I think that, that showed a lot of people here in South Norfolk what Labour politicians and what Labour politics is like in reality. Um, and nationally... The trade unions didn't form the Labour Party to have debates. They formed the Labour Party to get into power and improve lives, everyone's lives. And look at what we've achieved in power and what we can achieve in the future. So I just think a different way of doing it, really strong local people, doesn't mean local doesn't mean you're born there. I wasn't born in South Norfolk. It means you're invested in your community and you're genuine about it. If you're not genuine, you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. But if you're genuine with a fantastic plan, and you absolutely go for it. I, I've proved, and I have no doubt, we can win anywhere. We must win anywhere. We will win anywhere. That's my, here endeth the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Great, yeah, I think there's a lot that all of us can take away from that. Um, next up now, my geography says that Oxfordshire is the next most easternly part of the country. <laughs> if I'm wrong, please correct me, but I'm gonna say Oxfordshire. Uh, Shade, are you happy to come in? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Uh, well, Banbury is in North Oxfordshire, and we have a very distinct identity compared to the rest of Oxfordshire, shall we say. Um, we're quite particular about that, so just so you know. Um, well, our success story is that we held on to our district seats as nine councillors for Labour and the co-op on district council. And that, that was really important for us because we are surrounded by Conservatives. Um, we held on to our parish parish seats as well in Banbury. We lost one, unfortunately, but that was that. It was very close. The most important thing we found out from our electioneering was people value face-to-face -face contact. People value having their councillors in their communities and people value hearing, being heard. I'm the current mayor of Banbury as well. And it's just so nice to go around and people greeting you as a person. 
as opposed to just a counsellor they can moan about something. Um, the success story I would like to talk about is our Oxford County Council. As you know, we ousted the Conservatives and now we are in a coalition. And the main driving force behind that is the organisation. Up in Cherwell, we have um, a great coordinator, Paramoon, who sorted all our schedules out, making sure there were no, uh, no clashes. We were out and about and we used dialogue as well, really efficiently. We made over 3,000 contacts over dialogue, which was really important. Over a year where there was no, no chance to knock on doors, mm -hmm. to contact people was really important. And we don't just canvass during electioneering, it's really important that we canvass throughout the year. Um, we're just in, at the mm -hmm. moment, we're canvassing around our area, picking up casework and addressing those issues because people need to see you acting in the community, focusing on their needs. And the main issues facing Cherwell are housing, infrastructure, and we have, unfortunately, still, still poverty in, in such an affluent district that we need to address it as soon as we can and that would require Labour to be in power making those decisions. So it's really positive that now the county is um, in a coalition. Hopefully we can make those changes going forward. Thank you from the view from North Oxfordshire there. I shall remember, I shall remember that. We should all be aware of that now. Um, <laughs> so again, next up, uh, we've got Becky, you're joining us from Worthing. Uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And for clarity, I think we're a little bit east of Oxfordshire, down on the oh. south. Right, I'm not going to hold it against you. It's okay, you don't lose it. So thank you so much for um, having us along. Uh, this is our first sort of outing as Worthing to coast and country. We kind of stumbled across you because I think you got in touch with us to say hello. We are a, an organisation, so we're really pleased you did. Um, and we sort of were put on the map so to speak about four I've lost track now four years ago I think 2017 um, and before that there had been um, an, an active Labour group here and I can see Jim Dean is here now so there are some some uh, older familiar faces who have been in Worthing and have been stalwarts of the Labour group here for a long long time so our story didn't start four years ago but it's sort of built on the shoulders of giants four years ago and four years ago, we basically had a tipping point whereby we'd been doing lots of work uh, in and around the communities. Um, the Tories had have been in power for quite a long time here. Same old story. And uh, four years ago, we obviously had the 20, we had a general election, which we did OK in, not bad. We didn't unseat the father of the house, unfortunately, he's still there, but we did all right. Um, and then we had a by-election uh, in a ward called Marine. And... The Labour group said, well, we've done all right in the general election, but I mean, there's no hope. There's absolutely no hope of us getting a councillor on, on Marine, you know, in Marine, because it's a complete Tory sort of stronghold. We just need a paper candidate really to stand in this by-election. And I was absolutely knackered because I'd been the, the general election candidate. So I was like, well, that's nice. Go and find somebody else. And they were like, yeah, but you live in Marine. Why, why, why don't you have a go? I was like, no, I'm knackered. And I'm like, well, don't worry. It's a paper candidate. We'll, ne we'll never get you in. Anyway, we won that by-election, and I've never forgiven anybody. Who <laughs> uh, but on the back of that, not very, I've, not, I've never forgiven them, but I also think they're a marvellous team. On the back of that, since we won our first by-election four years ago, we're now four years down the line. And as Helen said, um, we are now a group of 15, and we are due to go to the polls again next May. And looking at the data that we have, um, it's basically ours to lose next May. So it looks like we'll either go to no overall control and there's a fair chance that we will take control of the council. So um, as, yeah, it's exciting, but as leading a, leader of the group, I'm also petrified. So if you've got, I'm listening for tips. I'm like, oh my God, what do we do when we win? But you don't want to hear about that. You want to hear about how we won. So uh, I'll give you a really quick, quick, brief outline of what we've been up to down here. And I'm sure listening this morning, lots of the, the stories and the narratives resonate. So it feels like we've got some real common themes going through, which is good because it makes us feel like we're on the right track. So as I've said, the Tories have been in power here for a long time. There was a brief spell of um, Liberal Democrats sort of uh, running the council, but they totally messed it up with NCP charges. So they went by the by. So the Tories have been here for a long time and it's basically, uh, you, if you've ever heard of Worthing, it might be that because Andy Murray said it was a really boring place to spend a wet weekend, which is a really great sort of tourism thing for us. Um, but it's changed a lot. So we are just down the road from Brighton, which is obviously much hipper and much cooler than us, but not much. <laughs> um, but the demographics are shifting. 
Um, and what we're seeing is that Brighton is incredibly expensive. It's got London prices. Worthing's a bit cheaper, not much from the South Coast, but we've obviously had the demographic shift. Older people are heading off to wherever you head off to when you shuffle off the mortal coil. And we're getting younger families in from Brighton and also from London. So we are having a demographic shift, but it's not enough to account for what has happened here, which is basically Labour about to take the council. Um, and even the uh, statistician for the BBC said, I can't really account for it. He sort of said Worthing as sort of this anomaly at the last elections. And he gave a, he gave a lecture about it. So whatever it's called. And said, I can't, I can't really account for what's happening in Worthing. Demographic shift is not enough. It must be, and I quote, something to do with the bins. And I wrote to him and I said, if you ever dare say that again, you can come down and knock on a few bloody doors and find out what we do, which goes to the heart of what people have been talking about this morning. So I'll tell you three things I think really that have made the difference for the Labour Party and for the community here in Worthing. And the first thing is that even though I'm talking a lot now, what we really do well down here is we listen. We tend to shut up. So politicians are really, really good. We tend to like the sound of our own voices. We tend to think we've got lots of great ideas. One of the first things we did when we started getting out into communities is we shut up and we said, what's going on? and what do you want? And we, we listened, we listened on doorsteps, we listened in street stalls, we got involved in the communities, we wandered around our local parks, we went to see dog walkers, we went to see people who had problems with housing. We went to see everybody. We went to see people who had lots of money, people who had no money, people who had moved here yesterday, people who had been here for years, and we just listened. And we got a real sense of what it was that the council could do for Worthing and that it wasn't doing for Worthing. And that was the big differentiator between us and the Tories. And at one point in full council, we said this the 90 odd time to the Tories and the leader of the Tories actually turned around and said to us, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't need to ask the community what they want. We know what the community wants. And I thought that is, your, that is your death toll because you literally have stopped listening to them. So that's what we did. We listened and we still listen today. We go out and we do listening surgeries. We knock on doors, we do street stalls, and we try not to do as much of this talking as I'm doing now. The second thing which has really worked for us is that we're a group of 15 and we're all really diverse. You can see Helen and Jim here and we've got really diverse councillors, but there's not just 15 of us. There is a group of activists and Worthing's a bit peculiar in, the, in terms of CLPs. It's got East Worthing CLP and it's got West Worthing CLP and they have their own characters as well. And in the greatest tradition of the Labour Party, we are not all the same. We do not all agree on everything. Um, <laughs> ideas about leaders, about ideology, about this, that and the other. But what we all agree on is that we're here to serve the community. And that is what we put front and centre. And when we don't agree on things, what we do agree is that we'll disagree in private. So in public, we are there, we serve the community, we listen to the community, we put ourselves second and the community first. And then we all go down the pub and have a good old ding dong about whatever we're, you know, whatever we're doing. We'll have a good old ding dong about that. We love it. We're politicians. We want to have a good old chat about it. But our public face is professional and we do the best we can. And we've got activists that support us and they get out time and time again for us. And our councillors are familiar faces in the community. And I guess that leads me to the final point that I want to make is that, and I've heard lots about local candidates, local people, and I absolutely agree, you don't need to be born somewhere, you don't need to sort of, you know, have been 40 years and wherever the place you want to stand, that doesn't make you a good candidate, but I think it was said earlier, what does make you a good candidate is understanding your community and understanding the needs of the people that you represent. And when we listen to the community, and I've had this leveled at me by journalists, they say, well, that's lovely, but you listen to the community and surely they just tell you about your, their fears and their concerns and their bin issues. And I say they do, but they also tell us about their hopes and their aspirations and what they want for their future. And what we do as leaders in our community is we reflect those hopes and aspirations. We hold their fears and concerns. We understand there are issues here around immigration. There is quite a strong Brexit vote here. There's all sorts of things going on. We hold that. We say, OK, fine. But we also hear the hopes and aspirations that people want to live decent lives. The vast majority of people are happy to help other people. We saw that in COVID through mutual aid groups, through going and getting people shopping through. We all got involved in that. The vast majority of people really will give people a hand and be decent if they're listened to first. And similarly to what other people have been saying, we have a lot of people here who have voted Tory their whole lives 
who have now changed their vote and vote Labour because they see us in the community doing decent things. Again, we can discuss the ideology about neoliberalism and all the rest of it. And, you know, if we get to Parliament, we'll have a good old go at that. But right now, what we do is we want to do the best for the local community. We want to represent their hopes and their aspirations. And we want to change the council so that council listens to people and it's actually involved in the community. And that is why I think I'm petrified because we're about to take the council next year. Thanks so much. Well, you heard it here. Everyone needs to get themselves down to Worthing next spring to help out. And Becky, we look forward to waking you back, welcoming you back to our conference next year as leader of Worthing Council. <laughs> no pressure there. Um, and our, so our final speaker is Nia, who's our Shadow Welsh Secretary. Uh, are you happy to go? You can, I, I can't actually see the rest of the panel for some reason, so I apologise if it sounds like I, I can just see myself. But <laughs> Nia, can you hear me? Well, delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be at uh, Labour Coast and Country again. And I've been asked to uh, speak specifically about what we want from the party. So I'm going to focus on that rather than specifically on, on Wales. Obviously, I'll take any questions. And I think first and foremost, uh, we want to have uh, coast and country mentioned by everybody all of the time. And I know that Daniel Zeichner, Luke Pollard and Jeff Smith are constantly, constantly telling my front bench colleagues Look, please, please, please mention coast, mention country, mention rural policy in everything that you do. Um, so no good as just mentioning uh, Labour Wales or Labour Mayor of Manchester. Everybody knows those are Labour. It's absolutely vital that we say, look, you know, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough elected a Labour mayor this year. Um, the West of England elected a Labour mayor this year. And it's been fantastic, obviously, to hear from Nick and Dan this morning. So it's really important that whether we're uh, showcasing a new policy, whether we're launching something, that we use rural background, rural issues. And of course, we want a uh, specific rural policy developed, but we also want it to run as a thread through every single policy area, because we all know that many of the problems are common. You know, things like low income, things like uh, poor um, health, uh, outcomes. We know that we have populations within our areas that suffer in those ways. And we also know that the solutions are far more difficult to deliver in rural areas, whether it's transport, whether it's uh, broadband, whether it's access to, to shops, to medical services, to educational opportunities and so forth. So, and housing. Uh, so it's absolutely vital that we reference uh, the rural um, all the time in everything that we do. Um, we have to aim high. We know that we have got many, many, many CLPs that we need to win back. We want to win more and more council seats. And we have old areas we want to win back. We have new areas we want to uh, win in. And we are, of course, seeing those changing demographics in our areas. And we're also seeing shifts in, in voter allegiances. Now, we don't have infinite resources in the party. Uh, we have a limit. Uh, the number of staffing available. So we need to think more imaginatively about how we use staff. It's no good thinking that you know, an organiser can simply you know, drive, spend several hours driving and then spend a, a few hours running a, a session. But that may be valuable if it's a first time area, an area that hasn't had much help before, uh, but uh, it's not particularly good use of time. We as the activists should be doing that. We're the activists, we should be out on the ground. We should be doing that work. And many of you may laugh because you've probably never seen an organiser in your CLP. Um, but where the, see, uh, the, the organisers come in, I, it's upskilling for them and then them using their skills to train us. There are so many more opportunities now with Zoom. Uh, we can do a much more training. We don't have to you know, trek a long, long way, give up a whole Saturday, you know, spend two hours getting there, two hours getting back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can do this on an evening in the weekday, particularly as the nights draw in. We want to keep our Saturdays from being out there on the doorstep. So uh, all the traditional areas of training that we want um, things like, you know, canvassing, campaigning, being a candidate, phone canvassing with dialogue, policy development, leaflet writing, manifesto development and so forth. All of those we still need because we're always getting new people on board and new skills and obviously want to share ideas. Um, the other issue that the Labour Party can bring to us is data. Many of you will be aware that uh, Deborah Mattinson, a uh, very, very experienced uh, bolster, is now leading for us on strategy. And it's looking at some of that data. It's looking at saying, well, this is the group of Labour voters that we want to win back. 
because we seem to have been losing some of them. These are the potential people that may fairly easily be persuaded to vote Labour. These are people who may be a little bit more difficult. And looking at those changing demographics within our areas and going and aiming for some of those seats we never thought were winnable. There's nothing worse, is there, than coming away from an election thinking we under-aimed and we only lost the seat by three votes because we didn't put the effort into that particular seat. And you just think, you know, 2012 for us in Wales was a, was a case in point all out council elections and many of us under underestimated what we could have done in that particular election. So it's really important that we use that data, we use the information that is available to us and that the Labour Party can crunch for us. But of course, that's got to be partnered with being on the doorstep. Nothing replaces being on the doorstep. Being on the doorstep, having that very important engagement with the voters, that very important conversation about whatever local issue it is, but also recording the data. Which person was it that you spoke to? It wasn't the whole household, it was one person. What did they say? No, they didn't say they were going to vote Labour. No, they said they might, they might, you know, be careful. Be careful about what we record and, and obviously build up that very, very, um, very regularly, together with, of course, phone numbers and email addresses. Now, there are various and legitimate ways you can do this through surveys and so forth, but everybody would have noticed using dialogue that it is the landlines and the older demographics that we're hitting. And if we want to be hitting the younger uh, generations, then we need those mobiles and we need those emails. And then digital campaigning. Now, every one of us dabbles, but we all know vast majority of us here would admit that there are more things that we could learn. So you know, gone are the days that you've just got to learn to take a good photo of yourself. You've got to be able to make a good video. You've got to be able to use all of that effectively. You've got to be able to know how to market and use the right sorts of uh, social media and do the right sorts of uh, reaching out on social media. And how do you respond to Tory attacks on social media? What are the best ways of countering that? All of that matters but of course has to be linked as was mentioned uh, earlier to the high visibility the local campaigning and being out there being out there as a person as a human being because then you are a human being and you're helping to break down any negative stereotypes they have about labor you're a labor person they're doing something fantastic in their community now we are a marvellous resource here together today and it's lovely to see everybody but we are not using this resource effectively enough. Um, many of us could be mentoring other people, we could be helping you know, more experienced council leaders, helping less experienced council leaders, many of us could be twinning, we don't have to be you know, sending a carload of people to go and canvas to the neighbouring constituency now, we can be twinning and talking to people right across the country, uh, we can be having speakers even when we go back to meeting in person, we can still have a speaker on Zoom. Um, we can be using our resource here as trainers, as mentors, people here who've got digital expertise. Um, policy. Today we've heard so many uh, references to policy. We, some of us stood on fantastic manifestos in the spring elections. We in Wales had a Labour government manifesto. We've heard from the mayors today about you know, the, the, the Cambridgeshire Compassion Cooperation community. Um, but all of these ideas, they're somewhere around, somewhere that we might be able to find if we tap into the right places on, on the internet, but we don't have them centralized. So I think we need to be um, much sharper at collating those lists of speakers, lists of people who want to meet up, who want to twin, people who want to look at specific policy areas, people who want to tackle problems they're dealing with now in their local council, people who want to develop policies for uh, their future council elections. All of that, we need to make a resource which is much easier for us to, to link into and to be able then to, to use so that we're sharing and that we're not constantly reinventing the, the wheel. And so that title uh, plea as I, as I finish is very much that we really do find some mechanisms and ask our party staff, and I'll certainly be talking to Shaban Mahmood, who's you know, leading in the, in the campaigning role in the party, um, on uh, how we can do this better and how we can share and share across so that we can get the very, very best for our communities, because that's what we're about. Well, well said, and, and thanks for that. I think, I think we all agree that uh, the more organised we can get, the better. Uh, I'm sure everyone on this call would love one for their CLP, so any, anything we can do to I think, increase our sharing of our knowledge and experiences is really, really valuable. 
Uh, and on that note, it's a brilliant segue for me, I didn't plan. Uh, is there anybody who's got any questions, particularly interested in the name of people who aren't from the areas that we're here or that haven't really been discussed up till now? Uh, is there anybody from another part of the country that's done well, or that maybe hasn't had success and kind of is looking at other areas um, for inspiration? Um, If you uh, put your hand up in the chat, if you uh, if uh, oh, there we go, John. Uh, yeah, so John, uh, you're you can unmute yourself, perfect, John. Thanks for that, and thanks for those inspirational speeches. There, they're, 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 it's superb to hear how we're doing well in areas that we just consider were Tory areas, and of course, Worthing's reputation goes before it with uh, with what's happened there. Um, my question is about dialogue. Um, I come from a CLP that is really, every time we mention using dialogue, it's very negatively received. And I've heard there that lots of people with positive stories about using dialogue. And, and this was one, uh, I, I think that uh, a number of our speakers have already spoken to, uh, um, you know, to how that benefited them. But I wondered, again to the panel but also more generally to everybody else do people use dialogue is, is it seen as a positive uh, campaigning force in your areas um because i think it is but my clp disagrees with me unfortunately i mean i think i can say personally that dialogue was hugely beneficial to us in the metro mayoral campaign um it's a great way to call people who you wouldn't be able to knock on their door so you, you'll look through canvassing sheets and you'll see these contacts in these little villages that you'd never be able to drive to because it's like one house on a road, but you're able to call them. So I think it's, uh, from our perspective, it was really valuable. Um, Becky, I think you want to come in? Do you guys use dialogue in words? Yeah, I, actually, I was just going to ask um, my lovely colleague, Emma, to talk to you about dialogue and she's got a hand up. So I think she's probably going to have that, right? <laughs> Sorry for, <laughs> sorry for being camera off, guys. I'm not usually so antisocial. Um, but um, thank, thank you. It's been great. Um, honestly, I think dialogue uh, played a big part in um, being able to get elected in May. It was especially challenging in COVID times that we couldn't knock on the doors as soon as we wanted to. We don't have phone numbers for everybody, but what we found was we were reaching the sorts um, of places that we couldn't always get to by mm -hmm. foot i.e. Um, an elder demographic in flats that were less accessible mm -hmm. to us anyway. And I was having conversations with people who maybe um, voting Labour wasn't their natural, but it allowed me to talk to them very generally and to give them some reassurance in myself as a person and the party locally and what we were trying to do. And I really feel like it was possible to make a connection with some people by, by doing that. So I would absolutely intend, even though I love door knocking, to uh, use it again in May when we need to um, get someone re-elected in our, our ward. Yeah. Yeah. If I might come in, uh, Jonathan, um, I, th I think it's absolutely vital that we do use dialogue and nobody likes it. OK, none of us, none of us want to be on a what is a treadmill. Let's be honest. It's it's a, it's like the it's like the modern day treadmill, isn't it? Because as soon as you've done one, another one comes up. Um, none of us particularly like that. And it's very, very hard self motivating. Um, you know, what are you going to make yourself do in order to make sure yourself do it because you're at home, you haven't got the, you know, the team with you. So I think we have to um, really try and encourage our members and help them, first of all, obviously, to, to get the skills to do it. It's easier for people who are actually elected members um, because you can say, I'm phoning you as your local councillor. And it's easier sometimes to start that conversation with people. So the first stage, I think, is perhaps to get some of our elected members who are not so keen to, to take part a bit more on dialogue. The other thing is to try and give yourself very small targets. You must get 10 surveys filled in. That means that obviously you will make rather more than 10 calls because many will be out or you might get the phone put down on you or whatever. But give yourself a, a, a real uh, target to do that. And it's like, you know, it's like trying to make yourself go for a run every morning. It is really difficult, but you just have to try. Um, and 
the one of the ways you can do that, obviously, is like Weight Watchers, isn't it? You compare with other people. Um, so, you know, did you do your you know, 10 phone calls last night? You know, try to try to find a way which you can link in and you can get each other to to, to, to motivate each other. And of course, for rural areas, there are all of those bits that you just simply haven't canvassed except by phone in the past. Um, you know, there's many you know, tracks up to those farms and all the rest of it. And just think for all those horrible calls that you don't get through on, you still get through more people in an hour on a dialogue than you're likely to do um, walking up quite long garden paths. So it's definitely, definitely worth it. It doesn't replace being out on the doorstep, but with winter evenings, I would strongly recommend that you try to get over that barrier. And what I say to people is I say, look, I still have that feeling in my stomach. Every time I start, I think, oh, what's it going to be like? And I never have it when I go up to a door, but I do have it when I'm phone canvassing. I think, what are they going to shout at me? Because we all know, we all hate unwanted phone calls. Um, but once you're into it, of course, you know, you're OK. Uh, and, you know, set, set people a, a, a challenge. You know, if one of you wants to get on there and get 30 calls done or whatever, say, look, you know, I did 30 calls, uh, whatever, whatever um, time. Um, and, you know, try and challenge other people to, to do the same. I think one of the things that we found really useful in those sort of long winter months of, of lockdown was just having a Zoom where everyone came together to do mm. the dialogue calls. I think it was just a great chance to see other members who obviously hadn't seen each other in person for over a year at that point. It was, I think, just a really good way to kind of bring people together. Yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, a great way to reach out to members who don't want to come door knocking, maybe don't feel comfortable with it right now. So, uh, uh, Shayla, do you want to come in? Um, for us, dialogue was a, a great resource because we have a core team of canvassers and you can't canvass every evening for months on months and months because you have to forgive me they are towards the older years so we wanted to protect them as any case um to keep them safe at night times of course in the winter um and to give them a break from all that walking and intensity mm -hmm. so if we do it together as a group then it's obviously feels much better and safer uh, jeremy do you do you have anything to add on your experience of the dialogue uh, to be honest, um, we didn't really use it because it was slower than, you know, could probably do 10 houses in the one t one time of the call. But I take the point about it depends how long the garden paths are. But we just we just aim to hit every house. But I absolutely think dialogue's got a place in a longer campaign. I think it would be a really important part of a campaign, but no replacement for face to face. Face to face is weird. People want you to knock at, your, knock at their door. But as soon as you knock at the door, they can't wait for you to go again but they love the fact that you bothered to do it. So door knocking to number one, but I can see and hear that dialogue's clearly got an important place as, as one, of a, one of a range of strategies tied into a really simple plan executed brilliantly by a team of people. And Alex made the point that we were promised various prizes and stuff. Promises were made back in January about how the number of calls we made. So uh, still looking forward to getting that, that pizza and everything that they probably offered us. Uh, does anybody have anything else they'd like to add? Has anyone got experience in a different part of the country that they'd maybe like to contribute? Um, I think it, one of the things I've been interested in hearing more about is um, how everyone on the panel thinks the gains you made in the local elections are going to play out at the parliamentary level. Um, so uh, the four of us uh, who aren't MPs are, are from seats that have uh, Tory MPs in most cases for the last few years, I think, aren't we? Last 30 years for us. Last 30 years, yeah. So, so <laughs> since, since 2010 for me, I'm guessing, I think Worthing probably since time immemorial. I think since forever, really. I think Peter actually is <laughs> off the uh, furniture down here. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's been there for 50 years, hasn't he? Yeah, forever, forever, yeah. yeah. So um, how do you all think that um, these elections are going to play out at the national level? Because I mean, I, I speaking as having Rhys Morgan as my MP, I, I think these elections show how weak he is uh, and really show how disliked he is. I think that there's a lot of capacity for us to make gains uh, at, at the general election. But I want to see if that's, you know, is that the same kind of how you're feeling everywhere else? Uh, Jeremy, do you want to come in? 
Yeah, I, I, the, the plate tectonics are, shif are shifting underneath us, and I don't think everyone's realised it. All seats are up for grabs, and no seats are safe. It, it's, it's a, it's a do-over. I, I think we go everywhere, hit everyone, knock on every door, because um, there's going to be some massive shocks next time. I can't wait, hopefully, in our favours. Again, the old battle lines, they're, they're, they're not just obscured, they've almost gone. It's, it, we're in a different time. It, we're, we've just been through a war. Nothing's ever the same after a war. This is a time of huge social change, huge introspection, and people like the Labour mayors and us councillors showing a new type of polit human politics. It's going to really resonate with people. So nobody knows. And that's without the Tories being found out and the wheels coming off, which is inevitable at some point. I totally agree. Uh, uh, Becky, do you want to come in? I love Jeremy's enthusiasm. Jeremy, you're brilliant. I'm going to put you on some sort of podcast and just listen to you. You're amazing. Um, I, I, in part, agree with Jeremy. I think if you could have... Oh, yeah, David's just said what I'm going to say. Like, I think if you could knock on every door, that would be phenomenal. Um, even though we have a great group of activists here in Worthing, the are all volunteers and we love them very much and don't want them to burn them out. So we probably wouldn't get around every door. What we've got, David's just mentioned it actually. So for us, the boundary reviews are really interesting. So I think I said when I was talking that we've got East Worthing and West Worthing um, constituencies and East Worthing, the constituency goes into Shoreham um, and Lansing, so goes off to the um, east of it. And West Worthing goes off to uh, some little places called Ferring Rustington and East Preston, which is where Peter Bottomley, I think there are statues of him. So, um, so in terms of the next election, if it's fought in 2023, which sounds like it's going to be, although God knows what goes on in Boris's head, then I think it'll be under the old boundaries. So for Worthing, East Worthing and Shoreham against the lovely Tim Lawton has always been a bit of a target seat and will remain a bit of a target seat, but it's not all within Worthing Borough, if you see what I mean. But what's really exciting for us is that those boundary views have actually... Um, suggested and if they go forward which I think they will that Worthing as a place as a town essentially becomes a constituency so East Worthing and West Worthing become merged into one borough and then I think what you're talking about becomes really real because if we do hold the council and we don't completely make a mess of it fingers crossed and do a decent job then um, then I think that seat is really winnable for us so I do agree that actually it does translate as long as the constituency sort of marry a bit more closely together. So Shado, can you let us know what's happening in Banbury and maybe Nia you can give us a um, from the party about how targeting is going to look? In Banbury parliamentary elections we have steadily grown our share of the vote apart from the last parliamentary election and I hope that continues but um, we're more interested in the boundary change to be honest. Um, the boundary change proposal suggests Banbury should join with Chipping Norton and Chipping Norton as we know has, has turned red parish council and it's again the county councillor as well so I'm hoping that will be really positive for us um, um Victoria Prentice our current conservative MP um her reputation isn't isn't great um she hasn't as a role as a fisheries minister I don't think she's has a success at all so hopefully that will help as well so I'm not sure which ward she which county or uh, because it is she would go for, but um, I think the boundary review would be really, really, really helpful for us. Just seen someone in the chats raise their hand. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to come in very quickly before we ask Nia to close? Yeah, my question was, if we're going to target every seat, um, have we got the infrastructure behind us to, to manage to do that? Um, because we can't, we can't easily, um, we we can't easily um, get support from the the party for some of the the seats that we're that, that we're looking at at the moment. Um, you know, when we looked when we when we've looked for support, sometimes it's just very difficult to to get something from central from the central uh, um, organisation. So I think that that kind of leads on very well to what we're hoping to hear. I mean, so yeah, how how sort of hawkish can we be on our targeting next time i mean we i think the four of us all think yeah. our seats are winnable i'm sure everyone in this chat thinks their seats winnable so what can we right. do 
Well, I think, first of all, I mean, look, we're in a very, very difficult situation, aren't we? Because we're going to have these boundary changes hanging over us um, for 18 months. And the tricky thing is we don't know if the next general election is going to be on the current uh, boundaries or whether it's going to be on the new boundaries. As you'll all have been told many times, I'm sure there's a Labour Party response to the proposals. Um, and, you know, that that obviously will then work its way through this various um, sets of uh, consultations that there are, are to be. Um, I think we, we will never ever be able to target every single seat. There's always going to have to be some sensible thinking and there's always going to have to be some ruthless thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we actually, uh, you know, apportion resources. And I think that's why it's so important that we try and set up these structures now that we are able to help each other so much more and able to offer so much more help between different constituencies. And you know, it's great to see the number of people who've already um, offered to help in Worthing next year because they don't have particular elections in, in their patch. So um, why did we do well in Wales in the elections in the spring? Well, first of all, incumbency matters. So every single one of you that's holding a council seat, use that platform massively because you do have a much bigger platform when you're in power than when you're out of power. So that really does matter. And then I think being authentically Labour, I mean, that was something that we very much emphasised, you know, what makes us so different um, from the Tories. Um, that was another you know, way that really uh, we managed again to, you know, to capture people's feelings and to, and to capture their imagination. But in terms of how we use our resources, we're going to have to you know, face facts. We're not all going to be target seats. But what we do need to do is have built up that skill base within our own CLPs, but also being able to access it from other people that we know so that we can all help each other in that election. I think we're all, yeah, I think we're all agreed. I think we all appreciate that we have to sort of make some tough choices, uh, but hopefully these the events like this can sort of feed into the party's targeting strategy and we can look at, you know, where we're, where we're making gains. Uh, so actually, we're just finishing on time.